My name is JT Parr, and I'm traveling the country to interview geniuses and find out how the world works. After exploring the body and the spirit with martial arts expert Daniel Bellelli, I wanted to tackle the mysteries of the mind. So I met with Dr. Nantia Sathana, a neuroscience researcher at UCLA. She works with brain imaging and virtual reality to investigate memory and trauma. Her latest article demonstrated a potentially groundbreaking new way to treat PTSD. Here's our conversation. Where does being in like complete command of your motor skills come from? I've always Point felt like my kinesthetic awareness and my spatial understanding is uh, top of the heap for humans. So I was just curious, like, what part of the oh. here? Okay. What part well. of the brain does that come from? You can match it to the other side. I'm really there good you know. at puzzles. puzzles? Okay. Yeah, I did a test for ADD in high school, and I scored 100% on my IQ test. Yeah, yeah I don't know if they do percentages. But. So he is putting on a motion capture suit, has a bunch of little reflective markers that are being tracked by these cameras that you see on the walls. And we're putting a scalp EEG cap on him. It's a cap with little electrodes that can measure brain signals. So with virtual reality, we try to simulate real world experiences. So in the case of fear processing and PTSD, you know, we're gonna elicit a fear response using you know, a jump scare stimulus like a spider. So we'll try to you know, scare him a little bit and uh, hopefully activate his amygdala uh, is what we think we're doing. So we're gonna put some sensors on you. This is gonna measure your physiological responses. So it's like what your body's thinking. So it's subconscious. Yeah. What they measure is your level of arousal. They measure your autonomic nervous system. So you know, like fight, fight or flight. It went yeah. up? Yeah. No, 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 hold on. Oh, Gentle, sorry. Yeah. I think we're ready for the headset, yeah? Awesome. yeah. But you're gonna walk through the library, and at periods, the room color is gonna change. And at certain points, a surprising stimulus might happen. You have really pretty eyes. You too. Yeah, they're very soulful. Yeah. Whoa! Oh my god! What part of the brain seems to be correlated with spatial reasoning? A lot of different parts of the brain are important for spatial cognition um, and uh, hippocampus, for one, uh, but also areas in the parietal lobe, lots of areas. It depends, like, what aspect. The homunculus? So the homunculus is in the, <laughs> you know your terms, that's great. Um, the homunculus is actually right here and here. So there's a motor homunculus, which is for movements and uh, sensory, somatosensory homunculus, which is for touch. And that kind of explains like phantom limb syndrome, right? So phantom limb, yeah. So that's uh, when you know individuals still have a sensation in the in the area where the limb was, and that's because the brain area r responsible for that right. limb is still the input intact. is still there, but the yeah. output is removed. Right, right, yeah. That makes sense. You know a lot about the brain. Sounds like I'm learning as we yeah. go. That's kind of my endeavor in this whole thing is to better understand the brain, so I can better understand the people around me. Nice. All right, so you're gonna turn down this corridor. Each row is a different electrode on the head. This is real time, so this is his brain waves, you know, recorded right now. What the hell? <laughs> oh my God. That thing scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> All right, what's coming now? You're supposed to be learning. And what color was that? That was blue, I think. All right. Is it still there? No, it's gone. All right, you can walk forward. I've always been very interested in the diversity of how people learn. Why are there so many different ways in which people learn and what in the brain is supporting people to learn so differently? Um, how does it work? And, you know, in the extreme case where you don't have a particular part of the brain, you can't even form any new memories for events. What's the difference between semantic memory and episodic memory? Semantic memories are for facts and episodic memories are for events. So meeting each other for the first time, that's an event, versus remembering what the hippocampus does in the brain, that's a fact. And are they stored in different parts of the brain? So I don't know that we know fully, but we know that the hippocampus is necessary for forming a memory for both of them. In the book Musicophilia, Oliver Sacks describes a musician who has total amnesia but can mm. still remember how to play the piano. Mm, yeah. He greeted her as if it was the first time in years. It was like dying and being dead. Not dead, but it feels like it. Playing the piano is a different kind of memory, not episodic or semantic. It's what we call non-declarative memory or procedural memory. And that part of the brain is basal ganglia. So if that part of the brain is intact, then, then the person can learn new skills. <sighs> Brad, 
bring on the monsters. Oh. Yeah, that's scary. You got like a big paper that's about to come out, right? It's using the stimulation approach to treat PTSD. These are veterans who have come back with traumatic experiences that have turned into very severe tr PTSD. And so what we did is we used the device to determine a signal that tracks their traumatic flashbacks. We did lab studies where so they came in the lab, we played their trauma to them, and pleasant memories to compare. We found this signal in the brain uh, that comes from the amygdala. This is the center that is important for fear experience and fear processing. And we use that signal to trigger the stimulator. So the stimulator would turn on whenever that signal would appear. And for a whole year, they were treated in this way. One of them is in complete remission. Another one is doing much better. This could be a potentially new treatment for patients that have very severe PTSD. The next step is to you know, use virtual reality in this way that you tried to try to understand it in a more detailed way. Hey, can we turn this like from a library into my CrossFit gym? It won't be that difficult. It's like four squat racks. Whoa, who let the spider in again? Oh. Okay, so you saw two light colors. Yes. You remember? Green and blue. Okay. I was more afraid of the blue light. The green light is when the animals popped out. Yeah. The blue light scared me more because nothing popped out and I'm more afraid of the uh, unknown. Do you think I got smarter during this interview? It seems like you did. And in terms of your knowledge base. It, it got like, better? Did you learn anything? Do you feel I think like so. You, yeah, okay. Yeah. Memory is one of the most important aspects of consciousness. With memory, you make sense of the past and plan for the future. You compare your current self to past iterations and form the composite of your personhood over countless individual moments. Without memory, the individual lives in the abyss of an eternal now constantly emerging into awareness, a nightmarish state of being without beholding. But I also learned that it takes a lot of different people working in collaboration mm -hmm. one another to have breakthroughs of any significance in the realm of science. Very true. And so it's not necessarily about one individual's knowledge, it's about how that knowledge interacts with the other people who are around them. Nice. And that was important for me to know because I do want to be like a solo rider sometimes, mm -hmm. but I got my dogs and I need them and they need me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you guys need uh, extra homies to cruise through, I'll bring a 30 rack and my buddy uh, Corn Nut and Dolan would be happy to attend. And uh, my buddy Chad is my main dog. So yep, just keep me posted. <laughs>